Hello folks and welcome to the channel. I don't think that I haven't been working on cars or anything like that, but I have been busy with many other things because I had to work in the garden. And right now it is raining and I have some time now to work on the RF85. So let's go and have a look at it. Preparing a race car for the next event is always the same routine. And you've seen that in one of my previous episodes, all the things we do. So for instance, we check in all the bolts and the nuts that everything is securely and in place. We're changing all the liquids, we're checking the brake fluid, we're checking the brakes, the brake pads and all that. So I'm not gonna go through all that again. You might as well have seen that I actually prepared the gearbox with different ratios because the track I'm going on is a quite different track than last time. The track we are joining on Sunday is called Zolder. It's a highly technical track and I will be able to develop quite some speed. So, As you might have seen in the previous episode, we have replaced some of the gear ratios in the gearbox. So now this is all nicely reassembled. We got it all nicely sealed up. We filled it up with oil. And remember last time I told you that we filled it up with oil. I will let it sit for a while and then double check again. And I have placed my finger in the hole or we did double check so the oil is good. So I actually configured the gearbox with the proper ratios to be able to get up to that speed without running out of RPM. So if you want to see on how I've done that, then I recommend you look at my previous video. And you probably noticed that I have no tires on my front rims. And there's a good reason for that. So if the weather is dry, obviously we're going to race with our slicks on the car. But if it's wet or rainy, then I have to use my rain tires. Uh, so I have to have a set of boat available and taken with me to the track. So I'm now kind of preparing my rain tires as well. Have them all balanced out and checked so everything is okay. Making sure that the rims are good, that we have nothing bent and everything is nicely balanced and that the tires can keep their pressure. So while I was checking the wheels, I noticed that this rim here is having cracks. You can see the cracks here, 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 there, there. It almost circles around. There's only two more spots where I have no crack in that magnesium. And this is real bad because I have a central bolt. This is the part that holds the rim onto the actual wheel axle. Now, if that is pushing down and it cracks around this whole area, you're going to lose that wheel. And you don't want that to happen when you're driving at 190, 180 or even 200 clicks an hour. This is going to kill you. So that has to go and I need to get some others. And look, I had a friend of mine who had a couple of spare rims and this is one of them. And as you can see, this is completely utter free. There's no cracks in it. So this rim is in a good condition. So it's ready to get the slick tire mounted on it. So always look in the front and in the back. And as you can see, this one is crack free in the back and in the front. So that's why I'm having those two slicks here pulled off these old rims that have the cracks on and mounted on the two rims without cracks. And then the two rain tires, I will also mount them on two new rims, well, second-hand rims that are in a good condition. Brakes on a race car are the most vital part. And if you don't take care of them, you're going to get hurt sooner or later. So it's always important to check your brakes. And when I say check your brakes, it means check your brake pads that they still have sufficient uh, compound on it, but also your disc. Check the disc for damage and check it for thickness. Now, I know this is a very thin one. Now, originally, this is seven millimeters. Right now, I'm at about 6.4, as you can see. So that's still good. I have like half a millimeter wear and tear. I probably will drive with it two more times and then I'm going to change the discs out. So as you can tell, I have two master brake cylinders, one for the rear, one for the front, and I have fairly large brake fluid reservoirs. This is quite safe because if one breaks, you still have the other one. So it's important for every race that you're going to check your brake fluid and in fact, you should change it or flush it through. So if you look inside, uh, you will see that the brake fluid is still in a pretty good shape in terms of color, but color doesn't tell you anything. 
The brake fluid that I use is DOT4. Now, for the rear I'm using standard DOT4 performance brake fluid. For the front I'm using DOT4 uh, specific race fluid, whereby I have a higher dry and wet boiling point. So you probably wonder what this piece is. Well, this is a air collector. It's kind of a ducting. And I'm getting air from the front, air flows through it, and it's going to blow right here on the caliper because that's the part that is getting very hot. So my brake pads, well, they still have about a centimeter of compound on it, so that is good. And here is my brake caliper, and this is the part that is getting very hot because the disc and the pads, they will rub, and then the heat transfers to the brake caliper, and inside we have a piston and braking fluid. So that braking fluid will really suffer from heat. And you can't see that by just looking in the reservoir. So it's very good practice to bleed or flush your braking fluid inside your brake calibers after every race. And we'll do this by just releasing this nipple. And then we go in to install a suction system onto it. So we can suck all that brake fluid out of it. So that is a very handy and easy way of doing things. I just mentioned to you the dry boiling point and the wet boiling point of brake fluid. Well, the brake fluid I'm using is DOT4, and DOT4 braking fluid is glycol based with ether in it. And it has a tendency to attract water. So if you have fresh DOT4 braking fluid, then we call it dry. It has not absorbed any water, and it has a boiling point. And the boiling point depends a bit on what kind of brake fluid you use. Now, this one right here is my Ferrado racing brake fluid, and that boils dry boiling point at 328 degrees centigrade, and the wet boiling point is at around 200 degrees centigrade. Yeah. Now, I'm going to use this to, for my front brakes because those are the ones that suffer the most. And remember that my brake balance is set for 60% on my front uh, brakes, so that's why I'm using this kind of braking fluid. It's much better, the boiling point is a lot higher. So both are DOT4 braking fluids, but you shouldn't be mixing them. That is not a good idea. It's not going to do a lot of harm, but you shouldn't really do it. Now, other people will use DOT5, DOT1, I think, and that is kind of silicon based. That doesn't absorb water, so you don't need to change it that often. But it all depends on the race car you have. It depends on your rubbers. It depends on your calibers. And for these older race cars, DOT4 is more than good enough. For the rear brakes, I'm using the standard Castrol React Performance DOT4. It's good enough and the dry boiling point, I think it's around 300 degrees or 280. And the wet one is around 150. So uh, it's great, it's good enough for the rear brakes. But for the front brakes, I'm going to use my special racing uh, brake fluid. So let's put it in. And I'm not sponsored by Ferrado or by Castrol. I just wanted to share with you what I use. And bleeding brakes is something none of us likes to do. Either you're with two people and one is pumping uh, on the brake paddle and then you open up the nipple and then you let the liquid out. It's a bit messy and I don't really like it. One of the systems you could use is this kind of a reservoir. And you connect your compressed air to it, like so and then you just squeeze that trigger. And by doing so, it's going to create a vacuum inside and it's going to suck out over this hose here back to that bleeding nipple where you connect this piece. And then um, you just suck out the brake fluid and you keep an eye on your res reservoir and you keep filling it up so it doesn't run empty because if it does, then you have to start all over again. So this is a very handy and easy way to do it. So this is the hose that is going to that external reservoir just stick it on the bleeding nipple and now we just need to release it and then suck out that braking fluid. I'm going to top up my reservoir uh, for the front brakes and I'm using this uh, Ferrado Racing Super Formula braking fluid and you can see that the container is sealed off with an aluminum piece. Now once you remove this it's going to start accumulating humidity so you can't keep this forever once it's opened up. Uh, there is a limited lifetime on it, so keep that in mind. So I'm just going to open up the bleeding nipple. And now I just need to squeeze and see. 
and we should be seeing dragon fluid coming in. You see that? And I'm going to do this for a while. And then we add a bit more because you don't want to run empty. And we squeeze the trigger again. So, run. And then close. So now that is closed. Okay. We take the suction cup off and we are done on this side. Now we're going to the other side. And you can actually see how much we took out already. You see that right there? So that's what came out so far. And I think that's about it. The next thing you want to do is make sure that the brakes are really hard and not spongy at all. Well, let's see. I have my big boots on. I'm going to push them real hard and they should be solid. And if I keep pressure on, the paddle shouldn't go any further down. If it does, you have a leak. So you need to check those nipples that they are staying in place. And they are. And it feels like a rock. So if you wonder why I'm using different brake fluid for the rear, well, this is just an economical factor that racing uh, braking fluid is really expensive and I think it's around 34 to 40 euros for 500 milliliters. So that is a lot. This stuff is a lot cheaper, so that's why. And it's as good as the other one for the rear brakes, of course, because those are not getting as exercised as much as the front brakes. Um, so the brake pads are good, the discs are good, and we actually have flushed the brake fluid. So now it's time to change the engine oil. Now you're probably going to wonder how many times I change my engine oil. Well, I do change it every two hours. Typically we do run four times half an hour in a day, and that is for me the limit uh, of the engine oil. Other people change it less frequent or more frequent, but for me that has worked. Now the engine oil that I'm going to use is Castrol Classic XL. SAE 20 W50 that has always worked for me and that seems to be a good oil for this pretty old engine I would say. Now there's all different oils you can use but that's entirely up to you. For me that is a good oil especially since I change it quite often. Now the oil filter is changed every 10 hours together with the spark plugs. On this engine we just fitted last time an oil filter we also fitted new spark plugs. I will double check the spark plugs but I'm not going to change them most likely. Now, this is a dry sump engine, so I will have to suck out the oil because there's no plug underneath to uh, release the oil out of it. And for that, I'm using this big syringe, and you've seen this before. This is actually an AdBlue syringe, and it just works great. So I already took off the cover, so all I need now is to put that in there and uh, suck it all out. It's a little bit of work, but it will work. All right. So as you can see, the oil is getting a little bit darker already. And what we have in one syringe is about one liter. So I have to do this about five to six times to get it all out. So I'm going to fill it with five liters. And then I'm going to let the engine run and see what the level is. Because normally I put in about eight. But of course, there's still some oil in the oil filter. There's some oil still in the oil cooler. So that's why I might not need a full eight liters. So I want to make sure that everything is absolutely clean before I pour the oil in. All right. And you can see it's up to this point right here. So we still have a little bit to go, probably about two more liters. So let's check the spark plugs and see what state they are in. Now this heat protection did a real good job. 
And normally I don't change the spark plugs after two hours of driving, only after about 10 hours or so. But I want to make sure that the spark plugs are good. Well, they look clean. They look a little bit white on the side, so we've been running fairly hot. So that means that my mixture is probably a little bit on the lean side at the higher RPMs. So the spark plugs, they all look okay. They may be a little bit on the hot side, but then again, they are very clean, so they can go back in. I noticed when I was starting up the engine that the carburetor was really dripping on one side. So I already disconnected the hose from the fuel. So I'm going to take the lid off and see what's wrong with this. Maybe the float level is too high or the needle valve doesn't close anymore. But it shouldn't be dripping. That is absolutely not right. So time to disassemble the carburetor. Now I haven't seen that last time. Last time I was doing it all right. But then again, maybe we have some debris inside. Who knows? And I can also tell you that people have been messing around with this carburetor because these are not the standard bolts that you should find on it. And in the back we had one bolt missing. So let's see if we can take the lid off. All right. So this was the Venturi that was really a leaking. So this is my acceleration valve and I'll, I'll take it out just to check it out. I don't think that's the issue because I could see it squirt when I depress the pedal. Let's see. You see the little bubbles coming out on the side? That is actually the feedback from the acceleration pump. So that looks okay. I don't need to worry about this. Now as you can see, I've taken the carburetor apart. I didn't took it off the intake manifold, but I have removed all the jets. But this carburetor is not what your normal carburetor is. You might have seen videos from me where we looked at a degas carburetor, which is a synchronous carburetor. This is a degaf, which is not a synchronous carburetor. It means it has a, a prime barrel and a secondary barrel. Now, typically the prime one is smaller. Now this is a 32 and this is a 36. And you can see it actually on the side of the carburetor, it's engraved. Now the reason that this was done in the past was that it is more fuel efficient and you have a better throttle response uh, with this. So initially the prime barrel will open up while you depress the throttle. And once the throttle is depressed like I think two thirds, then the second barrel opens up so you both have an efficient carburetor at lower RPMs, but also at high RPMs when you're going wide open because then both barrels are working. And we also know that a small barrel results in more air velocity. And the result of that is a better Venturi effect. So that is why you have a good throttle response. But of course, a small barrel doesn't help you for letting the engine breathe at wide open. So you have to have the two. Now, if you look on this one, uh, this is kind of a modified version. It's supposed to be a degaf, meaning the two barrels work at different times. But if you look here, you see the two toot wheels here. In fact, both butterflies will open at the same time. So this is a typical construct for a degas, synchronous S, and not for a degaf, which is kind of progressive. This is not normal. This has been added uh, afterwards. So this is a heavily modified carburetor, by the way. And you'll see it as well on some other parts whereby they have blocked off the um, idle mixture screws on both sides. So there's no adjustment for that. Of course, you still have your idle mixture jets on both sides. They will still be in effect but not uh, the idle mixture screws on both sides. So there is a bit of difference. So if you're looking on my degas video, be aware uh, that you cannot apply everything on this carp because this is a slightly different carp. You can see this carburetor is a degaf. It's marked on the side and it's a 3236. So the smaller barrel or the primary barrel is 32 millimeters in diameter and the larger barrel or the secondary barrel is 36 millimeters. Now here you find the secondary Venturis and look 
how loose that is. This is not supposed to be that loose because it's going to drip on the sides. And they shouldn't. They should have a Venturi effect right in the middle. So those you can take out and I will correct these. This one I already have corrected, so this is solid. Now some people will lock it in place by putting a piece of a uh, gauge in the back here. So they use an old gauge for adjusting uh, spark plugs or adjusting breaker points and they just slide it in between here, a very thin piece. I don't do this. What I tend to do is take it out and on the side, which is not uh, going to the opening, I punch a few little holes with a sharp tool so the metal sticks out a bit and that will actually lock it in place. Is it permanent? No, it's not, but it does work. So here's our secondary Venturi, the side without the opening, and I'm going to use a sharp pin to just put some punches onto that. Not a lot, just a little bit, and you don't need to knock hard because this is soft material. And that should be enough to hold it in place. All right, you can feel the edges on it. So here is our secondary Venturi and you can see, you know, it's already a little bit more difficult to get it in. And now that is solid in place. And that's all it takes. Just, I took the top cover off the carp and I took all the jets out. So here we have the emulsion tubes, we've got then the uh, air correction jets and we have the main fuel jets for the emulsion tubes and then we have the two idle mixture um, jets basically and then we have the acceleration uh, valve and that's really all there is to it i got a few more other things like the filters that are sitting in the top cover of the carburetor housing and here is that part i'm just going to place it here for now i already have uh, put up a new seal this was the old seal as you can see uh, so it's always good to put a new seal up. I cleaned it all up and I did adjust actually the um, float level because the float level wasn't right. Now the float level depends a bit on what kind of carp you have. But in principle you're holding it up vertical and you let the float um, just touch that needle valve, not on the spring, but just touch it. And you measure the distance basically from uh, the, the gasket all the way to the top of the float. And I think for this, in this case, for a D um, gaff, it's about 41 millimeters. And then you do the opposite for the extended version, which is about 51 or 52 mil. And that's about it. You don't need to do more than that. I'm not going to show you all this again because I have all this in another video on my channel so if you like to see that on how we did a degas then you can check on that. If you're having a degaff and you're going to take it apart keep in mind that the jets will not be the same for the primary and the secondary barrel so don't mix them up because that's important. You can remove the carburetor from the intake manifold if this is what you want to do but this is a routine maintenance I'm doing so I'm not rebuilding the carburetor as such so I'm just going to clean it in place and therefore I like to use a piece of plastic. It's actually a bag that I cut open that I can put around it. And this way I can use my carburetor cleaner to get all the channels cleaned up and then blow them out with my compressed air. Sometimes I do clean the carburetor in situ but I always tape off my barrels so I don't get any debris inside. So that's why I have this black tape up here. And I'm going to use carburetor cleaner to spray in all the different channels and then we blow it dry. Just going to dab away most of the liquid. Then I'm just going to blow through all the channels. Now you see why I have this plastic laying around, right? Alright, 
And of course, I'm going to do the same now with all the jets, making sure they're all clean. So the first thing I'm going to install is the acceleration valve. And there's a washer on both sides of this metal piece here. So you want to make sure that you have those washers in. You don't need to over tighten things, but just tight enough. The next step is the installation of the emulsion tube. So there's an emulsion tube going in there and an emulsion tube in there. And those are F50s. And this is the emulsion tube for the primary barrel. And we put the emulsion tube in for the secondary barrel, which is also in F50. Now, on top of the emulsion tube, we have the air correction jet. And those are different for the primary and the secondary, so keep that in mind. So this is the air correction jet for the secondary emulsion tube. And all this should go in very smooth. Never force anything on a carburetor. The next thing we need to install is the main fuel jets, which are going on the bottom of the emulsion tube inside the fuel chamber. Now, the fuel chamber is now cleaned up. So that's good. Uh, again, they are different for the primary and the secondary Venturi. Now this is a little bit of fiddling to get it in, so I will be in the way, but here is that little fuel jet that goes all the way in the bottom there. And I don't do this with gloves because I don't have enough feeling. All right. So let's see if we can get this guy in gently. Usually I like to put it first in my hands so I don't cross thread anything, but I think we are okay. All right. The other good thing about having a plastic around is that if you drop something, and you might, you can always find it back easy. Otherwise it drops somewhere in the engine and it's sometimes very hard to find it. All right, so all that is done. So now all what's left is actually to install the top cover and we should be good. But before we do so, I want to make sure that the acceleration pump is working. So I'm going to put some fuel in and then I will activate the pedal, the gas pedal, and we should see fuel squirting out here. If not, well, then we have a problem. What I have not taken apart is the acceleration pump here in the back. Uh, when you overhaul a carburetor, you would put a new membrane up, but this pump is working fine. But still, I want to test it out. So I'm going to put some fuel inside the fuel chamber because that's the fuel chamber here. And then I'm going to depress the throttle and see if I'm squirting out fuel on those two jets here. That should work. Now, the little hole that you see there, this is the hole that fills, fills up the acceleration pump. Inside there is a channel with a little ball that prevents fuel coming back whenever we accelerate. The second hole on the side there, that is the bleed hole. So you can adjust how much fuel is actually squirted into the barrels by fitting in this little um, jet here, which is your uh, bleed jet or bleed screw for your acceleration pump. Now I didn't take that out before, but I'm just gonna show you what it is. So here you go. There's nothing really special to that. Uh, so make sure you have that in, because if you don't have it, then <laughs> your acceleration isn't gonna work too well because you're gonna push back all that fuel back into the fuel bowl or the fuel chamber. All right, so let's see what happens if we see squirts coming out. I might have to pump a couple of times. I can see it squirt. You probably see it as well. So I'm gonna quit. So it is squirting, so that is good. And now all we need to do is actually put the cover back up. So inside the cover, inside the cover you find a filter. Now, I'm having a new filter and this is the one we go into install. And then close that off before we put it all back together. And make sure on the cover that you have a good seal. All 
well, maybe it's better to install the gasket first on the carburetor top because um, there we have a fixation pin uh, which is right there. Right, so, and now let's see if we can get this gently put into place. And I think this is now nicely into place. And all we need to do now is bolt it down. And I'm not going to reuse the old bolts, but new bolts. I'm not going to tighten this right away. Just slightly until everything is in. And then the last part that we need to install are these idle jets. I already cleaned them up in the same way with the carburetor cleaner and uh, compressed air. I also put a new seal up. You've seen that little rubber seal that goes around it. Don't forget that one. Otherwise you're going to suck false air. And that should be it, except of course connecting now the fuel to it and we should be all set to go. So let's see if we can get it started and if we have no leaks. I can see we have a leak. See that coming out here? That is because the seal is no good. So that's always important to check for those things. So that is a, a socket 19. I'll put a new seal up. As you can see, the red one. Let's close it up again and see what happens. This sounds uh, fairly good. The dripping problem is completely resolved. So as you have seen, with a little bit of work, the carburetor is now corrected and working properly. The engine is running smooth. Now, of course, you don't run a race car on idle, but I think it's going to work out just fine, and we'll find out on Sunday, won't we? So now what's left is putting the front wheels back on, and then I want to show you one more thing about the Hans device that I recently got. This is a Hans device and it provides head and neck support in case of an accident. So you put it around your neck like so. And then you have some attachments here. You see those? These are actually going to your helmet. You clip them on your helmet on both sides. And then when you have a crash, your head cannot fly that far forward, so you protect your neck and your head at the same time. Of course, you have to have a helmet that has these connectors to it. Now, the problem with this Hans device is that the width uh, of this here isn't wide enough for your harness, because your harness needs to come over it. Let me show you. So, you would be sitting about here, and this is the hands device, and the seat belts would have to come over it, right? So, the harness needs to go over it, like so. But as you can see, this is not going to sit very nice, just because the seat belts or the harness is wider than the actual track that we have here. There's a little side uh, protection thing here, so the seat belt should slide in nicely. And not like this, because this isn't right, you know? They claim it, it's okay, but I don't think so. So 
be careful if you're buying a Hans, um, that you buy one that is uh, suitable for your harness or the width of your harness. I'm just gonna show you how these things clip on. So here's your helmet and this is your strap from your hands. And all you need to do is push it in and pull it backwards and now it's in place. You wanna take it off, push it in, and pull it forward and you're done. A very good system if it would only fit for my seat belts. So folks, we are kind of finished with this episode. Uh, it was a little bit more work than I what I anticipated, but now the race car is ready to get to the track. And you'll see my video most likely next week, Monday. I hope that you enjoyed it and I'll see you in my next video. And please, by all means, comment because I do like comments, no matter if they are positive or negative. Bye-bye.